And I'm glad that you decided that this would be a good idea because I think, um, you know, we've had plenty of conversations, you and I. And, uh, you know, fortunately for me, I've gotten to meet a lot of the people in the group and as well as outside. And this is something that's pervasive, uh, this idea of your body fighting you or you fighting your body. It's kind of like a mix, right? You know, we yeah. talked about this this concept of the relationship that we have with our bodies very often resembles more a shoving match and the ideal is to transition it and create essentially a waltz with it. It is, and it's a beautiful analogy for people who are watching um, and you've gotten a little bit, some tidbits from this. If you have a chronically, uh, a chronic condition or even a disability because disabilities um, force us to use different parts of our bodies and muscles in different ways and they can create pain. If you're dealing with pain and you're dealing with a chronic condition, this is a great live to watch for you. Armando has been so compassionate and caring and reached out to me just out of the goodness of his heart. And and that's what he's doing today is helping you. So, cool. I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> well, thank you for having me uh, again. Uh, I've really enjoyed being part of this community. And, you know, I, I wanted to welcome everyone as you're kind of trickling in. And I understand that this is kind of like in the middle of the day. So a lot of people are working and doing their thing. Mm -hmm. But as as you're listening to this, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of paint the picture of what this is about, what it is and what it's not. So actually, let's start with what it's not. This is not going to be you're going to watch this and you're going to be cured of everything. Your life is going to be rosy all the time and there's never anything going to be wrong with your life. In fact, it's the exact opposite. The likelihood is you will have continued flare ups. You may have you will probably still have some pain. You'll still be struggling with autoimmunity by by the time that you're done with this. The difference is you'll now have a new perspective and a tool set or a toolkit to use whenever you're in that position or even better to avoid a lot of the situations that put you down and and essentially take your body into a full on attack and we'll talk a little bit more about that and and you know I know Hillary we've had these conversations and I know that this is something that 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 you've had issues with right you know it's like you're going you're going you're going and then Everything is going, you're full steam ahead. And then it's like the, the wheels come off and you're like, whoa, what just happened? And now I got to take a step back, regather, and then try to heal up from that and then go back. Right. And it's really about planning for your worst day, like you and I mm -hmm. talked about. And it's about um, knowing your triggers and your limitations as well. It's super important to get in touch with those things, whether they're dietary, whether they're, um, you can't work yourself to exhaustion. And, and you know, and this is part and parcel with don't compare yourself to people because you don't have, your schedule doesn't have to be the same. Um, you don't have to do the same things that people do. You don't have to accomplish the same things and you're not the same person. So going into this aware of what you need to work on is uh, very important and integral because it, it, it guarantees that you are going to have better days and you want to have better days. You want to have better days more than you have tough days and you actually right. can do it and you actually can do it working for yourself. Right. So, uh, you know, here's why it's important for you to listen today. Um, if you want to feel more in control, that's the number one thing, right? Because one of the biggest issues that I've seen is when you are in your darkness, when you're kind of in full uh, flare up mode, when you're feeling, the, the feeling is that feeling of feeling trapped in your own body, feeling helplessness of not knowing what to do and everything that you thought was reality because everything was going well and then you hit, it's like somebody slammed on the brakes and now everything that you thought to be true is no longer true. And whether that's actually true or not, that's that's something that's debatable because in your mind, that is true. But like, what do you do from there? And in your body, in your body, that is true too. Because there's sometimes where it's like, well, I, I can't go anymore. I simply right. can't go anymore. And it is all dependent on your condition and, and what you deal with. 
every single day. Only you know your limitations, but you do as the owner of an autoimmune disease um, or of mental health and depression. And we can't, we can't just include that either because that manifests in physical symptoms or as we talked about disability or as we also have talked about, even if you're doing a shorter term treatment for cancer or something of that nature, there are times when your body demands that you stop. And so it's all about anticipating and creating a life around, I said adaptations and Armando said, let's talk boundaries, which is super mm -hmm. important. So this is, these are preventative measures. At the same time, you have to live preventatively. You can't just right. fly off on a whim and go to a new city and, and have a five city tour of whatever you want. You really need to plan your life. Right. And so let, let's, you know, part, part of this planning or look, part of what all of this is creating these, like I said, like this toolkit that you can count on that pre, that brings in more prediction or response in your life. Right. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about the brain. But what I'd like to do is kind of lay out what this presentation, this master class is going to look like. So first thing is we're going to go over a few definitions so that when we say something, when I say something, we're all on the same page. Uh, from autoimmunity to pain to really understanding a lot of the intricacies. So we're all starting at the same place. Second thing we're gonna do is talk about our relationship with our body. This is really important because as with any relationship, if you don't cultivate a relationship, it's not gonna get better. So talking about having a healthy relationship and how to approach it so that it's something that's actually serving you and not something that you're always in, you know, at war with. Um, the next thing is we're going to go into the four key factors that you have control over or you can have control over that directly impact the way your body feels and responds, especially with autoimmunity, mental health, and pain. And then finally, we're going to do any Q&A. If there's you know, any Q&A, anybody has specific questions. So if you do have questions, I just want to put that there. Um, you can type it in here. In the, in the little chat. And I'll try to like scroll through it after when we get to it. But if I'm not answering it, type it again. I just don't want you to forget it. I, I wanna make sure that I answer your questions to the best that I can. And, and we can move on from there. Is that, does that work? Well, and I want, to, I, I want to make sure that people understand where you're coming from. So Armando has a background in physiological, the physiological basis. So he's a uh, physical therapist, but then he's also moved into mindset coaching. So there's a psychological component as well. So this is like a beautiful merging of every kind of coaching that you need and actionable things that you can do. So this is why this is a little bit different today and it's um, designed to help you, especially chronically ill, disabled, entrepreneurs. Great. So let's start off with autoimmunity. What is it? And again, these are not medical dictionaries, but uh, uh, definitions. But what I want you to do is when I'm talking about autoimmunity, this is any, any opportunity that the body gets that it's essentially feeling under threat, and it is officially attacking you. Mm -hmm. And so what would normally feel okay to most people, your body, it thinks that it's a war cry to fight against. And so very often, that's exactly the feeling that, that, that gets expressed to me, right? Because I don't have any autoimmune disease, let's just say, uh, that I know of. <laughs> you know, I don't experience these symptoms. So I'm not saying this from a person that has it. I'm saying it from a person that serves other people with it. Um, this is what gets communicated to me is this feeling like, I feel like my body's attacking me. I feel like I'm trapped in my body. I feel so exhausted all the time. I feel like everything that I want to do, I can't do because my body doesn't let me. It's kind of like there's a disassociation from the person you are and the body that you're in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, cool. So um, that's, that's the context that I want to give you for autoimmune disease. And again, there's more technical and there's a variance of different autoimmune disease, but it, essentially it is that your body is essentially attacking itself. Second thing is pain. 
more often we feel pain in certain joints and certain places. And so we think, oh, my, 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 my elbow hurts or my wrist is hurting or this. And yes, they are hurting, but understand that pain happens in the brain and not in the joints or muscles. You experience them there, but it actually, it's a brain event. So pain is a brain event. It only happens in the brain. So whether you broke, let's just say you broke a bone and you're in pain, or you're having like your, your brain thinks that there's something really bad with, let's just say the same arm and you're experiencing pain and you hear doctors say, oh, it's all in your head. And it's become something where it's almost shameful to think that, oh, it's all in my head. And no, it is always in your head, mm -hmm. first and foremost. And there's nothing wrong with it because your brain creates your reality. And so just like a vivid dream that you wake up when your heart is racing and you're sweating, your brain does the same thing. If it perceives a threat and it feels like it needs either more support or it's not ready to do something, it's going to slow you down to preserve itself because our number one thing that the brain does is try to keep us alive. And so anything that it deems uh, unsafe, it's going to use pain and lack of range or decreased range of motion are the two main things that it does to diminish you moving and go, basically stepping into more danger. Does that, does that make sense? That makes perfect yeah. sense. And, and this, you could, you're not, uh -huh. it's not in your head. This is what I want people to know. Kai Adams, who is on here right now, I have transverse myelitis too. And girl, I feel you and I'm glad you're here. And you know what? It's not in your head. It's not resolved by people questioning your pain. And that's not what you're going to get today. You are going to get all the validation and love that you need. And, and again, and th you know, I th thank you for, for bringing that up because too often it's this feeling of I'm all alone and nobody mm -hmm. believes me. And it's worse when, like, mo that's, that's why most people want a diagnosis because it gives validation. It gives some certainty. Well, at least I have this. There's nothing worse than feeling lost. There's right. nothing worse than feeling uncertain. And so... That's why diagnosis become so like people reach for them because, and sometimes you're like, oh yes, I have transverse myelitis or I have MS, which you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you be excited about that? Because <laughs> the certainty of knowing what you have is better, even though it may be something that is not great to have, mm -hmm. that is better than the uncertainty of not knowing what it is. I had, I had an experience where my brainstem swelled up and, you know, they call it idiopathic, meaning that this, that's the medical version of saying, we don't know what it caused it. We don't know what it is. Um, just that your brainstem swelled up. And for a while they thought I had MS, right? Mm -hmm. And this is someone, this has happened to me my sophomore year in college. I was, I ran track and cross country. I was taking more than a full load. So I had a lot of things going. And to me, the thought of MS, me that I express myself physically quite often, that thought of not being able to do that was very, very scary. Luckily for me, it ended up not being any of that. And they still don't know what had happened and I never got it again. So wonderful. But the point is that sometimes the not knowing is more scary and worse off, yeah. um, which is why so many of us seek for diagnosis because at least now we can hold on to something which gives us a first step to or a baseline a platform to take the next step but when you're uncertain that next step is very uncertain and it's very difficult to take that next step because you're like well should i go here or should i go there you don't trust yourself because right. your body has betrayed you and so you have no idea what type of decision to make right and you said, I think you said something really beautiful right now, which is your body betrayed you. And that leads into the next, the next, the next point that I wanted <laughs> to make. This is what happens. Every time we talk, you're like, you said something and this is what, and it always is this illuminating thing. <laughs> so, she, you know, the word that you use is that your body betrayed you. And that's what it feels like from the outside. 
because we don't see the big picture. We're just getting the, the back end of that. Mm -hmm. In all honesty, the, the body did the exact opposite. It's done what it's always designed to do is try to keep you safe. It just feels like it's been betraying because your agenda or the body's agenda for you doesn't align with your agenda. And that <laughs> conflict feels like a betrayal. Yeah, totally. And, and, and that's, that's the, the analogy. When we started this, this, um, this Facebook Live, this masterclass, one of the things I said is, what is that relationship that we have with our body? And most of us, especially when you're dealing with some kind of chronic illness, it's exhausting, first of all. Dealing with a chronic illness, stepping away from the pain itself is exhausting. Having to deal with the uncertainty of, is today going to be a good day or a bad day? Mm -hmm. Or is today going to be a social day? You're always on pins and needles, not really sure. It's, you might as well go to Vegas and roll the dice, right? Because sometimes that's what it feels like. And hopefully as we go through this and you understand these four key factors, they'll be less like going to Vegas and more like making more conscious decisions to minimize the risk. Um, so the relationship, like you had said about this idea of the betrayal, yeah. that verbiage is very much in alignment with what I call the shoving match, which is what starts <laughs> to happen is your body is trying to communicate with you and instead of us listening, we want to push back because it doesn't align with, again, our agenda, what we want, what our plans are. And um, there, there's, a, there's a great meme that I saw, which was, it, you know, it shows a picture of, you know, our plan for success. And it was like a picture of one point here and then the other point over here. And it's a straight line. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> it said, you know, under it, it says, God, God's vision for our success and it looks like valleys, valleys, <laughs> valleys, you know, you're climbing. It's rarely a straight line. Um, it, it, it requires the valleys. And in fact, when, when I wrote the book, one of the, the things, the analogies that I made is, you know, when you look at um, an EKG, if you look at a straight line on an EKG, which is the thing that measures your heart uh, pulses, the electrical impulses of your heart, when you see a straight line, all of us have seen it on TV where you hear that beep and that flat line, right? <laughs> that means death. Most of us are trying to achieve this flat line for whatever reason, whether it's up or not, but this flat line versus a healthy EKG is actually peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. A healthy life is filled with peaks and valleys. So part of this is understanding that, embracing it, and then being willing to learn something from each and every one of those valleys and getting more clarity on each and every one of those peaks, right? Because at the peak of something, you have the advantage of seeing further than you did before, right? Was it, uh, I think it was, uh, was it Newton or Einstein that said, if I've seen so far, if I've, if I've gone so far, it's because I've, sh I've, I've stood on the shoulders of giants, right? Mm -hmm. And our life is filled with these ups and downs. Every time we get to an up is an opportunity for us to see further than before, even if it's just one step further or miles further. But it's an opportunity. And when we're on our darkness, we get to see the perspective of everything in front of us because we're at the bottom and we see the darkness and we see there and it's scary. It sucks. But it's an opportunity for growth because in order for you to get out of there and shift from that, that, that valley, you do need to grow and become a different version of yourself. One that's a little bit stronger, a little bit more certain, a little bit clearer um, to allow you to move up, let's just say that next peak. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, let me, let me just kind of get a little shout out here, see... Um, where each and every one of you are as you're on here. If that makes sense, just just type in, just say, give me a thumbs up or a yes or a heart. Just let me know that you're alive and you're still listening. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're, we're in the, we're, I haven't lost you yet. So if that's the case, give me a thumbs up or a, or a heart or whatever it is that you want to throw in there. Um, so cool. Um, the shift from, thanks Simone, there it is. Give me the A-OK. -okay. 
all good. All right, Kai. Um, so the relationship, what's the inverse of that? The inverse of a shoving match is what I like to call um, the waltz, right? When you're dancing the waltz, there are steps forward, steps to the side, steps back, and that together in unison, right? You and your partner, in this case, you and your body have to sometimes, the, the body takes two steps forward, which means you have to take two steps back. Sometimes you sidestep together. Sometimes you take two steps forward and the body allows it, right? And guess what happens when you're learning the dance? You step on each other's toes sometimes. So it's painful. It doesn't always look like a professional dancer. So don't expect that. If you understand the concept of the dance, understand that there's a progress to learning and mastering anything. So as you're learning to dance with your body, know that there's going to be hardships, pains, stepping of the toes. That doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. It just means be patient and take it one step at a time. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and I like that you went into the waltz because you had mentioned that before, but I wasn't thinking about the steps of the forward, the back, the side to side, and and not resisting. Not resisting because you're both, it's kind of like you're both leading because there are those four steps. So it's not like really anybody's leading, but you're doing it together. So I, I like that idea that you explained that. Um, that makes that makes much more sense and um and, it, and i love the analogy even more <laughs> yeah Great. Kai, right kai says the same thing she loves it too <laughs> right good good I'm, I'm glad it resonates um so here do, i again if you have any questions make sure you type them in there I, I haven't scrolled through this so maybe you've already asked some questions and we'll get to it at the end i just don't i want to make sure that we answer everything since you're on here um but I'd like to go into the four key factors that will affect your body, your autoimmunity, your pain, your mental health in and of itself. And the four are your mindset, your nutrition, your movement, and your environment. And I'll define each one of those so you understand. So um, mindset, we're going to put in two, actually two different things, your brain set and your mindset. So the difference is the following. You can't have, let's just say, a positive mindset if you're not a human. And what I mean by that is, in order for us to understand that a little bit more, our brain is, we have essentially three brains. We have our most primitive brain, our reptilian brain. That was essentially responsible to keep us alive, right? The most vital functions to keep us alive, make sure you're eating, drinking, procreating, um, you know, keeping us as a species alive, first and foremost. Second one is your mammal brain, your mammalian brain. That's responsible for hierarchy and tribal community. It's one of the reasons why us as humans value this that we're doing right now. Having groups, tribes that are like us, that have something similar to us that we can connect with and grow with. But that part of the mind also is the one that says you walk into a room, and I'm sure you've done it, and you get like this energy from this person. You're like, man, that person doesn't like me. You haven't even talked to them. What is that? It's us knowing who our tribe is and our brain picking up on those, those variables that allow us to know, hey, are we in danger? Are we not? I'm sure you've been in situations where you're like, eh, I should probably not be here. Something doesn't feel right. And then you take a step away and you find out that something bad did happen. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. and that is part of these brains that keep us alive and keep us growing. The final part is our, what they call our neocortex or our new brain or our human brain. This is when people say, Hey, think positive. You know, you gotta, you know, you gotta have a clear vision for your future. Let me ask you this. If you've ever been in a really bad place in a really dark place, I don't know if you've ever had somebody tell you, Hey, think positive. And you just want to fiddle them through a wall because at that moment you can't, you can't because you are no longer a human from a brain perspective. You've downshifted to an animal, reptile or mammal, one or the other or both. Like, okay. So that's where you are. Pause that. Pause that. Let's reinforce that and dig into that a little bit more deeply. 
Okay. This is why you can't move into a positive mindset because you are no longer a human and you're right. not accessing that part of your brain. So this is amazing because there's work to do to get back to the human state where you can create that positive mindset for yourself. Right. So first thing is brain set. And that's what we're talking about. The brain set is making sure you're a human. So uh, my mentor Dax, who, who essentially taught me all of this, he says, you know, one of the things, and he says is you can't meet the human until you feed the animals essentially. Yeah. Right? So until the animals are content, you can't meet the human. And so to, to me, that's one of the big signs. You cannot um, just do it. You know, you can't just suck it up. This is not what this is about. You can't just grind and hustle through this. In fact, it does the exact opposite. It's like if you're in a hole and somebody says, just do it, that essentially means keep digging which means you're not getting out of the hole. You're just digging a bigger, a bigger hole. Right. What you need to do is stop digging and start climbing out. Once you're out, now you can start building a platform to take the next step. But if you're in a, in a hole and you keep digging, all you're doing is digging a deeper hole. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to get you out of the hole so that now you're a human so that now you can take the next steps. Does that, does that make sense? This is a lot to do with acceptance, too. When you're in the hole, and when Armando and I first started talking, I'd be like, I'm in the hole, I'm in the hole, I'm in the hole, I'm always in the hole. He'd be like, well, you have to accept that you are going to be in the hole sometimes, okay? And I would just be fighting and fighting and fighting. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I can keep up. I can do this. You have to accept this is just a part of your life. It's like um, maybe you have an allergy to seafood, for example. You have an allergy to seafood, you're not going to go out to Red Lobster and order the shrimp <laughs> fettuccine. Okay, this is your thing. This is what you have. So you can say, you know what? I don't want to be in the hole anymore. So I know I need to be in bed at least laying down by 8 o'clock, for example. And, and it's accepting that it's okay to have what you have, so you can come out of that hole. Right. Definitely. Definitely. And, and so, so that, that essentially is the quick version, right? Because all of this can, we can, we can do hours upon hours on each one of these, <laughs> but I want you to have a grasp of this so that you have something to build on in the future. Mm -hmm. The, once you're in the right brain set, now you can tie, tap into the right mindset. Right. So now you're out of the hole. Now you can look forward. You can self project. Right. Or self actualize, meaning you can think into the future. If you're in the animal brains, you cannot do that. So it's very important when you feel stuck. That you're like, oh, you know, like I need to think more positive. I need to do all of this. You need and you can't do that. There's a good chance you're in your animal brains. So we need to get you out of that. Mm -hmm. um, I figured let's just work on this for a second before we move on to the next one. So how do you get out of those animal brains, right? I think that's the next logical question. Amen. Because I don't want to leave that with a cliffhanger, right? <laughs> uh, come back next week and we'll oh tell my you. Oh, know. God. <laughs> I, no. <laughs> <laughs> That'll drive someone crazy. Um, yeah, all right. So exactly. here's, here's a simple, I'm not going to see you say, here is one way that really for the most part, shifts you out of, out of being an animal for a second, is gratitude. And I know we've heard it before, um, but you getting out of your own head and serving someone else is one of the ways that actually helps you shift it relatively quick. Because what you do is right then and there, you are shifting your perspective by shifting your perspective your reality changes right away mm -hmm. it does mentally it shifts automatically so if you find yourself in the hole and you're feeling trapped and helpless one of the things that you can ask yourself is who can i help today 
who can I serve in the best way that I can today? Not compared to the next person next to you, in the best way you can. That may be reaching out and saying a word of encouragement to somebody that you know is having a bad day. That may be helping a, you know, the, the, the cliche, helping the old lady across the street or, you know, giving a homeless man something, you know, or, or even better, acknowledging someone who's homeless, right? Because more than anything, the people that are homeless, think of how many cars they stand in front of for whatever their reason. This isn't about why they're there or what their intentions are. But most of those people, they are in front of asking for money. And what do most cars do is ignore them. So after a while, yeah. your level of significance goes down. And so you actually, more importantly than giving them something, you actually looking at them in the eyes and saying, hey, what's your name? You know, I'm praying for you or have a nice day or here's some money or here's this. But what is your name, right? It doesn't get more personal than your name. And I don't want, again, don't put yourself in a position where you put yourself in trouble, right? Don't do this at two in the morning, no, no street lights, and you're going to approach someone. It, that's not probably the best time to do that, right? In the middle of the day, maybe you're okay. I, look, I don't, you know, I don't want to get anybody into like a worse situation, but you also have to be aware of your surroundings, right? But the point that I'm trying to make is, is acknowledging someone with something so personal as their name. When was the last time somebody asked them their name and how much more powerful that is to them than any, any food or, or, or money that you've given them? Because you've given them something that most people neglect, which is you've given them the status of a human again, right? right. right. So that's, a, that's a kind of like a different topic, but I, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is when you step out and you serve someone else, it automatically shifts your perspective because now you're shifting it to helping someone else. The other thing that often happens is you have to move. You actually have to physically move to do something for somebody else. The, the act of physically moving is yeah. another strategy to get you out of your hole because it shifts your perspective physically as well as emotionally. And, em so those are and emotionally, uh -huh. I mean, it's, it's helping, but it's also reinforcing to you that you are valuable, that you do have value, even though you have this crappy disease, even though you have it, you can still make connections with people. You can still move your body. So it, it moves you out of that perspective of kind of worthlessness and this is all I ever deal with and I hate it so much and I can't get out of it. You have actually positively contributed and made a difference. And you can do that with your disease. You absolutely can. Right. So that's how to get out of the hole, right? Those are, those are a few actionable strategies that will help you get out of the hole and move you from an animal to a human. I love it. Once you're a human, once you're a human, now we got to look at the, the, the mindset component of this. If you don't have a clear vision for what it is that you want to create in your life, if you're just going from day to day, every day feels like a slog because anything and everything you're moving is extra weight because there's no clear path as opposed to, hey, if I got to go up to the top of the mountain, like if I had to carry a backpack full of supplies every day and I don't know where I'm going, it's just going to feel like dead weight that's weighing me down. Sure. But if I know I have to get to the top of this mountain, I'm like, oh, wait, this is food. This is water. This is uh, re these are resources to get me to the peak of that mountain. All of a sudden, this is my lifeline. It's no longer an anchor. Right. So understanding what your vision is for what it is that you want to create, what kind of a life you want to create is absolutely crucial to to actually moving in that direction and actually feeling good about it. Because if you don't have that vision, you don't know where you're going. Right. You, right. you know, any way is the right way is the wrong way. You, how do you know? Right. And and then the other component of that is when you're looking at your mindset is you also have to have something that drives you. 
something greater than yourself, okay? Um, you having an easy life, I think was it Bruce Lee has this great quote that is that, you know, don't pray for an easy life, but pray for the strength to endure the life that you have. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, is that, you know, in the media, in our society, the idea of being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. the idea of, of having to work at something over time and it being hard is actually shunned. It's everything is the quick and easy way. If it's not quick and it's not easy, it doesn't matter. If it's not your ideal life or if those aren't the ideal people that support you like a cheerleading squad, you need to get rid of them. That, that in, my, in my opinion, in my, my experience, is not life and you're missing out if you think that what you need are yes men all around you to make yourself feel better. Right. You are a person that interacts with people. You need to be able to interact and communicate even if somebody doesn't agree with you. That doesn't mean that you hang around with toxic people. There you go. But yeah. But it's not that you're, you know, hey, your family members don't believe in everything that you do, so you're like, hey, I got to fire my family. And it's like, no, they are still your family. You still love them. You just don't necessarily have to spend all your time right next to them mm -hmm. and hearing that, you know, surround yourself with the people that are going to that are going to support that and demand excellence from you. Right. So uh, we kind of moved a little bit into environment there. But but I wanted you to really understand that having a strong driver greater than yourself becomes the engine that moves you. Having a clear vision gives you a, a destination and then understanding the path, right? The, the process that you need to go through yep. gives you the steps that you need to take on a day-to-day -day basis. And when, yeah. you're, when you're in that place, it's kind of like being in an avalanche. Like you talked about, you don't know which direction you're going. So any direction is good. When you're in an avalanche, if you're ever in one, spit. Because however your spit goes is going to determine what direction you're facing. So anticipate there's going to be an avalanche. You're going to be swept away. You're not going to know what to do. You're maybe not going to be able to trust your body. So rely on the one thing that you know you can do. I mean, sometimes we start with very basic things. Like, I know I can feed myself today. Okay, so I, I can start my trust level with myself there. But it's important to rely on those things that you know you can do to get out. Yeah. I don't have that many avalanches down here in Miami. Um, <laughs> I haven't experienced too many of them. <laughs> yeah, we're in Minnesota. Avalanche day! I'm so sorry. I, you know what? I need to invest in like a, a, a tripod, I think. I'm going to try and see if I can set this on something. I swear I'm Got still it. Here. I'm just going to see if I can set this on something. I swear I'm still here. Got it. Okay. Um, so the next one is diet, right? Um, or nutrition. And we've heard about this, but understand that your nutrition is, as Hippoc Hippocrates said, you know, let, let, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And the, when you're talking about autoimmune diseases, the, the foods that cause inflammation – are going to be one of the worst things for you. What are those things? Processed foods, sugars, very often gluten, dairy. A lot of things that a lot of people like to have, but um, uh, caffeine, all those things really cause inflammation in your body. If your body is already feeling under attack and now you are putting inside your system these, these foods that are like foreign invaders, because that's what causes inflammation, your body, go, your body goes into DEFCON 5 and gets even hyper alert and more irritated and more inflamed, and then it's not happy with you. And then you feel like, um, what was the word that you used uh, earlier? Betrayed. That your, your body... Betrayed. Betrayed. Betrayed, right? Yep. yep. When in reality, you just put in a whole bunch of... Uh, you, you you put a bunch of mercenaries in there that started attacking there. <laughs> yeah. Well, what ended exactly. up happening. Exactly. And it's interesting. 
to think about the mindset switch of, oh, my body's not betraying me. My, in fact, my body's functioning. My body is functioning so well right now that it's confusing me. And so I need to just rely on what I know works to get out of this freaking avalanche. I, I'm going to have to spit. <laughs> right. <laughs> I didn't know that, but if I'm ever in an avalanche, I will know what to do now. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I, I think one of the things is, so I gave you, I gave you um, sugar. I gave you uh, gluten for most people, dairy for most people, um, caffeine. You know, if your body is seeking stability, draining your adrenal system with caffeine is not going to be great. Um, the other thing that that needs to be understood is that just because you've heard a food is healthy doesn't mean it's right for you right now. Right. Let me give you an example. Um, broccoli is a wonderful example of a of a of a really 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 powerful um, vegetable that can can destroy cancer, boost up your immune system, give you vital nutrients, except if you can't process it and now it causes inflammation, right? I'm not saying they do to everyone, but here is your body communicating with you. If you eat a food and you're getting bloated or you're gassy or you're getting reflux, it doesn't mean that the food is necessarily bad it just means right now, your body can't deal with that. Mm -hmm. So you may need to address other things like maybe some enzymes or your flora in your gut or who you're being when you're eating. Are you eating on the run all the time? Are you eating in front of stressful news all the time? Are you eating, you know, having dinner conversations with people who stress you out or are you really stressed out while you're eating? All those things contribute to how you absorb the food so it's not only just the food, it's the person you're being when you're eating that makes all the difference. Because if you're stressed out, your body is in what's called your sympathetic nervous system. If you're in sympathetic nervous system, that is your fight and flight kind of response, which means your body pushes all the blood to your legs, arms, limbs, ready to fight or ready to run, right? It right. doesn't do anything to your gut. What you want to be in is what's called your parasympathetic state, which puts your body in a rest and digest kind of uh, place. So that's when you're absorbing the nutrients. That's when you actually are absorbing everything and you're getting the energy from it or the nutrients even more because you can eat great food, be stressed, and your body doesn't absorb it, and you're hungry 20 minutes later, and you're like, how do I not have energy? How am I hungry again? How, you know, I'm sure this has happened at some point in your life. Um, and that's one of the reasons. So getting yourself first who you are when you're eating is absolutely crucial to digesting any food and actually absorbing the nutrients. So maybe meditate, put yourself in, a, in an environment. Again, we're going to talk about environment um, that is healing and conducive. If you're at work, don't eat at your table. Don't, don't, you know, <laughs> you know, don't work and eat at the same place because work has its own stress. You need to shift that, that, that function because your mental and physiological status at your work table is different than when you're sitting in a place of healing and rest and reabsorption. It should feel different because they're designed for different things. If you're trying to mix them, you're going to get mixed emotions or mixed physiological responses. And then now it's going to cause uh, an issue in your body, an attack of some sort, an inflammation, a frustration, both for you and for your body. So be that person when you're eating that is in a place of restoring and regeneration. Again, meditation. Take 10 deep breaths before you do it. Don't eat on the run. Chew your food a little bit more. Um, be around people that make you happy if possible, right? If music does it for you, maybe put in some calming music just to bring down the intensity level. If you're on the run and it's the only time to eat, 
you're better off drinking a little bit and doing more breaths and waiting than eating in a hurry. Now you have full inflammation, upset stomach, uh, yeah. reflux, and now your body from the inside out is feeling horrible, right? So I just kind of wanted to put that in context so that it's not just the food, but who you are when you are eating. That it makes a huge difference. That's so true because I'm telling you, here's a little anecdote, okay? So I was going crazy one day. I'm not a huge breakfast eater. Sometimes I, I like breakfast food, but not exactly like at 7 a.m. because it's kind of hard to eat that much. So I'm running around doing whatever. It gets to be probably like, you know, later morning. Maybe it was even like 1 o'clock. My daughter and I decided to go to Target. This was a recipe for disaster because I had had caffeinated coffee. Now I drink decaf coffee, by the way. But I had had caffeinated coffee and I had had nothing to eat. And then uh, we got through the checkout line and I sat down at the baggage area, you know, where all the paper bags are or whatever. And I was like, I I'm not getting up. And I had to like take my shirt off because I was overheating and I thought I was going to faint. So we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that to ourselves. We can't. We're supposed to be nourishing. Think about the word nourishing. Can you really nourish your body when you're in the car trying to shove a fast food burger in your face? Is that nourishing? So I just had to <laughs> add that in and tell you that you're one million percent on with that. <laughs> so let's shift over to the third one, which is movement. Mm -hmm. um, movement, not I said movement, not workouts. Okay. Yes. Very different. Or a workout can be movement, but not all movement is workout, if that makes better sense. And the way I define movement is moving your body, your joints, muscles, ligaments through a range so that it energizes, heals, and third one, excites. Those are the three recipe that those are the three ingredients for movement energizes heals and excites right if you're dreading it probably not going to be the best thing at least not right now yeah if if it's um causing more destruction and not uh um it's not healing then probably too much at this point your body's already under attack you don't need to attack it more yeah and the third one is energizes if you are like empty out your tank you're gonna do no one any good so it needs to provide those three things, energize, heal, and excite. I love it. How you, choo how you choose to do that, that's going to be different. And I remember we had this conversation re regarding your yoga, remember? Uh, I hope you don't mind me saying that. but No, that's okay because I don't do yoga anymore. And that's, and that's okay. one of the reasons because it was too hard. I had to be escorted out of the class. Um, every, not just once, every single time I wanted it so bad. I wanted to do yoga so right. bad. I really enjoy it, stretching and all those things every time because I couldn't walk. I had to be a squirt. I met everybody and I finally stopped my membership there, but I did buy a $99 recumbent bike and it sits in the living room and it's a movement. It's a repetitive range and it excites me because I can do it. And it's part right. of my environment. Good, good, right. So it's finding what that is for you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's, we think that we have to do certain things, right? Well, oh, I, you know, in order, you know, to feel good, I, everyone's told me I got to do yoga or I got to do this workout or I got to do this. When in reality, you need to listen. Yeah. Very often we want to do more than perhaps we, we want because we get excited. You know, we want to do more because you're like, I feel good today, but then we step over the edge. And when but it's freezing a little bit. There you go. You came back, kind oh. of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Hopefully that, that, is, uh, that is working now. Um, so uh, what I was saying is, you need to listen to your body and find what that is for you. It's not that yoga is the best or Pilates or strength training or, or running marathons is the best. It's 
what for you meets, energizes, heals, and excites. Right. And this is important because this is why you probably need at least one physical therapy appointment. This is a, it's an assessment of your body, how you're responding and what you need. What you need and the exercises that you need to do that are individual to you are very different than another person, even if that other person has your same disease. So, right. you know, with my transverse myelitis, it affects me in different ways than it does other people. It's considerate it like that. So we have to, you have to do the work to figure out what works for you. So I can do the cycling, but I feel best when I do probably no more than seven minutes. One day right. I did 17 minutes and I had to crawl over the arm of the couch because I couldn't walk afterwards. So that told me that didn't make sense. So you have to kind of experiment, not like a crazy person, and be okay with starting slow. It's, it's really okay. My doctor said, you know, you could go to yoga for 10 minutes and then leave the class. That wasn't ideal for me because it's hard for me to walk anyways to, and then driving and whatever. So that didn't work for me, but maybe it would work for you. Maybe it works to pop into yoga and then come out of it. You have to try to figure out what works for you. If it's like, um, cycling for example because that's low impact on your joints right if maybe you have rheumatoid arthritis or you have an, an, a joint inflammatory disease that might be something that you want to try if you're in a chair you still need to move those legs man right armando yeah yeah and, and again I, I think what you brought up which is a key component to this is very often we think Mm -hmm. that we're supposed to do 30 minutes or 20 minutes or an hour or whatever it is that we're supposed to do. It's like, no, 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 we start small. Think about it like this. And, and this is the rule of thumb that I have when you're trying to create something, especially regarding any new habit, any new endeavor is, can you do it on your worst day? If you yeah. cannot do it on your worst day, then it's too much, right? So the question is, is what are your, what I call your minimal acceptable doses for the day, right? Because part of this is creating this routine. So there's certainty in your day. These are things you can look forward to when you create these pillars, whether it's, hey, every morning at this time, I'm going to have my smoothie or mm -hmm. every, mo every afternoon or every morning at this time, I'm going to do my hip circles and movement for five minutes or it's um you know every every night before bed i'm gonna go and i'm gonna do 30 breaths just focus breath you know smiling and and just feeling gratitude right these consistent actions with minimal acceptable doses provide these pillars throughout the day that are they give you a platform to reach for the next one. And that prediction and response actually helps you to move along. And it helps you feel more confident and it actually energizes you. From that perspective, you start with that. That's a minimal acceptable dose. So even on your worst day, you can do it. But if you wanna feel like one of the days you feel really good, okay, maybe you can test out going a little bit more. See how your body responds but it's about listening to your body. And if you kind of cross the line, don't be frustrated and say, oh, I can't do this. Right. Say, no, my body's telling me that was too much. Let me step back and focus on being consistent. Consistent over years will, out, will outdo, will win over a workout done for a week or a month because your health is a lifetime endeavor it is not a sprint. <laughs> right. And we have to preserve what, I don't want to say what we have left because that, that works from a scarcity mindset, but we do have some challenges. And so it, it, when we look at the picture of like total health, for example, maybe you're not in total health, but you can preserve what you have to put yourself in the best position 
possible. And the good news is, here's the good news. You, okay, so if you were like a quote unquote healthy person, we'll say, you, you know, you would have no excuse, man. You would have to go and grind and push and all of these things. You get to feel good about these micro goals. And that's something Armando and I talked about before, these micro goals. You get to feel good about that. You get to give yourself permission to feel good about it. When I bike for three minutes, I feel amazing because I did it. I did it. And I, and I actually took a proactive action to take care of myself, right. which is really a cool feeling. Right. And, and look, you know, again, this goes back to kind of like this, this concept of perspective. And, you know, I would say, even if you are healthy, you should feel, <laughs> that's why I say minimal acceptable doses, because for everyone, that's going to be different. Exactly. Right. I, I'll, I'll give you context for that. One of the things that I wanted in my life was to be more consistent um, with my exercise. And that seems kind of weird because I, I do exercise a lot. But what was happening is that I would exercise a lot and then I wouldn't work out for three or four days. And then I'd get this great idea to go run for four hours and I'd be able to do it. But then I'd be kind of beat up for the next week or two. Right. And there was just like this up and down and nothing that I can count on. And so what I decided, it's been almost 700 days that I've been doing this. I started with 10 minutes of movement. This is actually where this kind of birthed this idea of minimal acceptable dosage. Yes. Right. Um, I started with 10 minutes a day that included, Hey, I want to make sure I do something every single day. And and it's something that heals, energizes, or excites. Some days that was a 10 minute walk. Some days that was a stretch. Some days that was running. Some days that was strength training. Well, fast forward uh, a year and a half later, I decided that I wanted to start running every day as well as those 10 minutes. So right now I just reached day 303 today of running every single day for a minimum of 30 minutes. Wow. For 303 days. I haven't missed a day. Amazing. Some days I was sore and I had to stop and do some exercise or something just to kind of break up the run or walk in the, but I ran 30 minutes every single day. And I share that with you because the context is you. It's not, you're not judging it based off someone else. It's at the end of the day, what excites you, energizes you, and heals you. For Hillary, three minutes is an opportunity to celebrate, which is perfect. Yeah. If it was one minute, it's an opportunity to celebrate. And then as you grow, you can move from there. I want to shift forward to the last one because time is moving along and I got to go pick up my kids. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a big one because I cannot leave them. So here's the last one. The last one is movement, uh, not movement, environment. And I put on there environment deals with people, mm -hmm. places, and actually everything that deals with your senses, right? We are sensual beings, meaning we experience the world with our senses. And so the way um, we interact with our environment makes a big difference. So smells, um, sounds, what you're looking at, um, who you're speaking to, all these things impact you as a person. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how can you create an environment that is not only supportive, it's healing, it's inspiring, it's something that puts you in a place where you feel safe to be you. That's important. Because you want to, when you're talking about people, you want to communicate with people, try to surround yourself with people that make you feel that way. That being said, is that this is not a one-way street. You also provide value to others. And the saying, this is a conversation that, that my wife and I had, is that I think that there's a false um, saying out there that says, you know, treat people how you want to be treated. The problem with that is 
very often we operate quite differently. And so the way you would tweak that is treat people how they want to be treated, right? Let me give yeah. you a kind of off the cuff um, example. I'm a person that likes getting excited. I'm a person that loves surprises. I'm a person that loves uncertainty and starting new things and change. My wife is the exact opposite. <laughs> so one of the biggest mistakes that I make is I get excited. I want to surprise her and it is the worst thing for her. <laughs> Not because she's unappreciative, but because she wants to know what's coming up because it makes her feel safe. It let, knowing what's coming allows her the time to plan and mentally prepare to get excited. Right. But let's just say I'm not, I, I haven't mastered that yet. I'm working on it, right? <laughs> I'm a, I'm a practicing, I'm a practice, you know, I, I had, I had a bishop tell me, you know, you know what the definition of a practicing Catholic is? One who's practicing to become a Catholic, a best version of their Catholic, <laughs> right? So I'm a practicing husband. I'm trying to be I like the best that. husband I can be. <laughs> and I am falling short in many ways, but I'm still practicing. I'm practicing. As long as I stay practicing, we're moving along, right? And right. the point that I'm trying to make is that when we're dealing with people, understand what they need, and that's how you serve them, not what you need. You don't right. give them that. There's a great right. book called The Five Love Languages. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. And it talks about the, these five love languages and the way people experience love. And very often we give love in our love language. And so very often our partner gets our love language, not necessarily theirs. Mm -hmm. And that happened to me when we were first started. My wife's, my wife's uh, love language is quality time. And I kept, you know, there were times when we were dating and she's like, man, I, I don't feel loved. I'm like, what are you talking about? I tell you, I love you every day. I hug you. I kiss you. She's like, I know, but you don't spend quality time with you. I was like, what are you talking about? We watch TV together. She goes, that's not quality time. You're, we're not having a conversation. You're distracted by the TV. I was like, oh, okay. You know, that may seem obvious to you as you're listening to this. It wasn't obvious to me, but that's the way she needed to experience. Or that's the way she, that was her way of experience love and I wasn't giving it to her the way she needed it for her to feel loved. Now I make it a point. It's something I have to be very conscious of that I'm actually giving her her love language, not mine. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Does that That's like it. have you had that experience? Oh my God. Uh, absolutely. My husband is um he he makes gestures. So he'll do okay. things for you. He'll do little things for you that always, you know, make you feel cared about. And I'm verbal. I'm verbal mm -hmm. and I hug and I'm affectionate. And so um, it's interesting. But the other piece of that is as you're learning, you're, you're a bumbling human, you're a practicing mm -hmm. human, that it's okay for your partner to have some missteps. Because I told myself like, okay, this is how, this is how I feel loved. But now I'm going to like expand my mind and say, I'm going to be really receptive and open to receiving the gifts of love that maybe I wouldn't have expressed myself in that way. Right. And it's really cool because it's like uh, if somebody gives you a Christmas list and they write down on there everything they want and then you get it for them. Blah. Be open. <laughs> be open to all of these different expressions of love and affection, it's really freaking cool. Right, right. Um, I, look, I, I, in all these things, don't expect to be perfect in any one of them. Mm -hmm. it, this is a journey. That's where all, like, everybody's always, ex like, can't wait to get to the destination, but the beauty and the magic happens on the journey. Does. And you, you have, to, if you don't embrace it, you're going to spend most of your time on the journey and a fraction of the time on the destination. So yeah. think about the simple fact that you're going to be spending so much time in there. Why not enjoy it? Why not, instead of coming from a place of judgment and wishing that, uh, you know, things were better, seek out the, the opportunity for growth. In every situation, there's an opportunity for you to make a decision to say, 
what can I get from this? Or look for anything and everything that's wrong with the situation. Because we can all pick out something that's wrong with any situation. We but, can, and I want to add on to that. And I know you have to get your kids, but I want to add on to that super quick. And that is, um, as a person with an autoimmune disorder, you need to minimize stress in your life. And sometimes that means letting go. And some, a lot of times it does. And a lot of times it means with your person, whoever that happens to be, that you cut them a break a little bit and you assume good things about them. So if my husband has a misstep, I'm not thinking, oh, he purposely made me angry. I'm not going there immediately. I'm saying, oh, okay, well, we you know, had a miscommunication or whatever. Because you need to do those things and you need to undergo that growth to get into that place for your body. You can't have drama anymore. You don't get to have <laughs> that anymore. You get to become that earth mother or father that you have been wanting to be. You get to let things go and feel joyful about it. And at the same time, too, the flip side, I recognize when I'm in the middle of a flare and my husband has to do everything, okay, it's okay for me to say with total self-love that I am not a circus that he gets to take care of. Like, I am not a party. I am not a fiesta. I am not, you know, some... Oh, yes, I get to take care of the princess. Like, there's none of that going on. It is, it's not a burden for him, but it is extra work. And you know what? It's okay for him to feel okay about that. And it's okay for him to communicate that to me. And it's okay for me to say, I know he's doing this, so I'm going to do everything in my power to make it convenient for him and to be compassionate to him. And we're not looking at ourselves as a burden, but we are acknowledging that taking care of another person is work. It just is. It's extra actions. It's extra thinking. It is an extra responsibility. Right. So again, I, I want to take the idea of the environment and how it affects us. Your room should be a haven, a sanctuary for you mm -hmm. of peace, of rejuvenation. Uh, whether you agree or not, studies have no TV in your room. <laughs> that is not going to help. Have things that energize you. Look at the colors in your room. Do an audit of your room and see if it, if it fills you with the peace, the joy, the, the, the sense of what you want to feel when you walk into that room. Very often we have our rooms the way we are because that's the way they are and we haven't done anything. If you don't feel what you want to feel when you're walking into your room, one of the most sacred spaces in your house, make it a point. Maybe you don't like the covers. Maybe you don't like the, the paint mm -hmm. on, the, on the... Change that as soon as you can because it makes all the difference. Uh, electronics in the room wreak havoc on your whole system. And I know it sounds kind of crazy out there, but if you want to experiment... Take out all electronics and make sure your room is pitch black at night. And I guarantee you, your sleep will be significantly better. Your environments make all the difference. So when you're going to create, have a creation environment. When you're going to eat, have an eating environment. What does that mean? That goes from your mindset to the people that you're on, to the place that, that you're sitting, to the, to the sounds that you're hearing, even to the temperature, if possible, right? The more things you can control and place yourself in optimal environments, the better you are going to be at creating the mindset and the, the essentially the body and, and life that you want. And again, this is not just some like woo-woo stuff out there. Physiologically, psychologically, if you create these environments, you provide a breeding ground just like uh, rich soil for mm -hmm. you to grow and blossom into that flower that you were designed to be. If not, then you're gonna have a tough time growing, right? The, the, the parable of you know, the seeds being dropped on the rocks, on the thorns, and on the rich soil. The, the ones on the rocks had no roots and got burned up by, by the sun. The ones in the so, in, uh, where the thorns were 
grew and got strangled by the by the thorns and the ones in the rich soil grew and prospered and provided for others right so just right. i want you to think about you are that seed or you actually are that soil you're the soil that helps that seed to grow and that seed is that greatest and grandest version of who you are today and who you can be tomorrow perfect cool i love it yes yeah. so um we i do need to get going so here's what i want you to do as you watch this as you're watching this if you have any questions post it there uh in the comment section as you're watching if you know if you're watching this on the replay post it on the comment section and if you know if you have any anything i'll make a video or uh, i'll type in the answers to any one of your questions as we get going but i just want to thank you hillary for for having me and inviting me as part of your group and and um allow me to do this i i just i felt really connected to this group and i don't want to have people suffer in silence anymore there are better ways and there are communities and environments that help you thrive you don't just have to survive so um with that i just want to call this a close and uh thank you so much thank you thank you so much for being part of our community and taking care of our people so well you're you specifically address our community and that means so much to me um please thank you simone for watching please make sure that you reach out to armando okay if you need help please make sure he is in our community and he has offered his services and he has helped me greatly so please make sure you reach out to him um and and you can post any question at any time any place in sickbiz at all reach out in any way and just be well be your best self and be well all right take care guys bye